If you enjoy this video, please remember to subscribe if you haven't already. And if you like what you see on my channel and would like to support me on Patreon, click on the link below. One can over-intellectualize what we did on Star Trek, but we always told stories of action, adventure. There was always a want, a need, a goal, feelings. And uh, we were the only show, for example, during all of the dreadful Vietnam affair, that ever, only dramatic show that ever talked against Vietnam. In my opinion, the audience is way ahead of our government leaders. I think the government leaders should catch up with the audience, and then we'd have 21st century dreams right now. These were incredible times. In 66, we were fighting <laughs> for freedom. The only thing that really pissed me off was they would show me the original script in which I had these wonderful roles in it. Only thing would be cut would be my role because the studio simply wanted to get rid of me. Why? A woman, number one, and a black woman at that, that finally hit them. She's part of the command crew. Michelle Nichols' character, Uhura, started to get written out of episodes. Michelle Nichols became frustrated and wrote a letter of resignation, but within hours a certain fan requested a special meeting. That certain fan happened to be Martin Luther King. And I stood up to turn around and meet the Trekkie. And there is this man, bigger than life human being, Dr. Martin Luther King. He says, I'm the Trekkie. He says, I'm the biggest Trekkie on the planet, and I am Lieutenant Uhura's most ardent fan. He began to talk about what Star Trek meant to the civil rights movement. And I said, I'm really going to miss my co-stars. And he says, what do you mean? What are you talking about? And I said, oh, I told Mr. Rottenberry that I'm going to leave the show. He said, you cannot. What you are doing and how you are portraying your character, you've changed the face of television forever. For people who don't look like us, they see us for the first time as we should be seen, as human beings, as equals. And I went back to Gene Roddenberry on Monday morning and I told him what Dr. King said and that if you wanted me to stay. And tears came out of his eyes. And he said, God bless Dr. Martin Luther King. Somebody knows what I'm doing. He's exactly right. By the end of the first season, I had so much fan mail that I didn't know I had. He said, we just thought you'd like to know that you get an awful lot of fan mail. Why don't you come and get it? I said, I get my fan mail. He said, no, we've got bags of fan mail for you. <laughs> Everybody gets great fan mail, but you and, and Leonard and Bill uh, get the most. What about the cast of the show? I'm told that NBC only wanted white males on the bridge, no women, no blacks. When I brought in a mixed racial crew, both the network and Desilu Studios, which had it at that time, came in saying, uh, what are you doing? You're going to ruin us. And then when I insisted on it, then the advertisers came in, the agencies, and said, if you show this black girl as an officer, dealing with white people on, on that basis, you're going to be barraged with the uh, hate letters and, and, and whole uh, areas of the country are going to refuse to handle your show. And we often forget that's how the country was then. Uh, one thing that makes me love viewers and love the, the audience is that we never received in 20 years one single letter of that kind. Roddenberry would push the envelope even further in the episode Plato's Stepchildren, with the first interracial kiss on television. Actually, the scene was, original scene, was written between Uhura and Spock. Bill got to, saw it and said, oh no, if anybody's going to get to kiss uh, Michelle, I, I mean Uhura, it's going to be me, I mean Kirk. <laughs> the kiss was considered too risky that the director of the episode was ready to cancel the scene from being shot. And so Bill kisses me. And the director goes, cut, cut, cut! He says, Bill, what are you doing? Bill said, it's a, I'm following the script. He says, they embrace and they kiss. You can't get us not to kiss. The director goes back and he's just unnerved by this. He says, fine, I have the solution. Shoot it both ways. 
As he doesn't kiss me, he looked up into the camera and crossed his eyes. He ruined the tape. The director was so happy we did not kiss. He never saw it until the next day. <laughs> and that's how the first interracial kiss got on television. He was um, handsome and athletic and, and smart and a leader and, and intelligent and funny and had lots of women uh, trailing him and men loved him and it, well, that was, it was sort of me. It was a good set. Everybody got along. Uh, Bill Shatton was very funny. He kept the, the, the whole tone uh, very lighthearted. Are you all right? Stay so yourself. I'll get it. Just a moment. <laughs> Just a moment. I'll have it in a second. Star Grace Lee Whitney, who played Janice Rand, had quite a close relationship with William Shatner on and off the set of Star Trek. You had quite a flirtatious relationship with Kirk, didn't you? He was supposed to be in love with the ship. And I was basically in love with him. They wanted me to like him, but don't be so obsessed. Well, we couldn't help it. We had a chemistry. You had a chemistry off camera as well, off screen? Oh, everywhere, sure. Did you ever have a, have a thing? With no, I didn't ever do anything. I just wouldn't put out. She acted in eight episodes of the series. In one episode, The Enemy Within, she had to act in one of the most difficult scenes to shoot where Kirk splits into good and bad versions of himself, and the bad version tries to rape her character. He beat me up. I was black and blue for days. Are you kidding me? No, I was black and blue because I did all my own stunts. Sadly, after just eight episodes, Grace Lee Whitney was written out of the series. This scene from the episode Balance of Terror would be her very last appearance in the series, as the character Rand. They did this because they wanted William Shatner to have romances in each episode with a different woman. Captain Kirk to be stuck with one woman on the whole series was not good for him. You know, it wasn't good for the audience. So that's what they told me. So I was written out. After Star Trek's cancellation and syndication, Grace Lee Whitney gained many fans and made many appearances at Star Trek conventions. Gene Roddenberry wanted to include her in the proposed Star Trek Phase 2 series, which was cancelled. However, Whitney would reappear as Janice Rand in the Star Trek feature films. A makeup man from the Lucille Ball show was hired to perfect Spock's pointed ears, which at times represented a major challenge for the makeup crew. Your makeup is most unusual. Does that take a long time? Well, it takes an hour and a half which after you've done it for the 150th, 175th time, seems like a very long time. <laughs> yeah. And whose idea was it to have pointed ears? Well, that started with Gene Roddenberry, who's the creator of the series, the executive producer. He, uh, he saw the character with pointed ears and various other physicals we experimented with. And, and I should say that just before we started shooting the show, we had experimented with four or five different types of ears. And we were not happy with any of them, and I got a little nervous about it. I thought this is going to be awful funny if these ears don't look right. And I went to Gene and I asked him to give up the idea of the pointed ears. And he said, no, he wouldn't. We're going to keep working on this and we'll get it right eventually. And he said, I promise you that if you do the show with the ears, at the end of 13 episodes, if you're not happy, I'll write you a script where you get an ear job. The easy press thing for the journalist was uh, Leonard Nimoy, he of the pointed ears. Or Spock, the one with the funny ears, you know. And I'd, I'd get invitations to come places and, br and bring your funny ears, you know. For an actor that took himself seriously, it was a little difficult. <laughs> Can, could I come without the ears? Would it be okay, you know? Well, you very seldom show emotion then. Is this very difficult? Seldom. Well, you mean from an acting point of view? Yes, from an <clears throat> Excuse me, not... Uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, but of course that's my job. Uh, showing emotion or not showing emotion, whichever the case yes. may be, is the actor's craft. You know, I'm often surprised when a, when a man comes in uh, to my house and can fix a leaky faucet, you know, uh, that I've been working on perhaps for a couple hours and only managed to make it worse, you see. That's his craft. He comes in and does it. My craft is to play interesting and unusual characters. Being in that character 12, 14 hours a day, my, my personality changed. In what way? Well, I became more rational, I became more logical, I became more thoughtful, I became less emotional. I drifted towards that Spock-like kind of being. I could feel it on the weekends. I, on Sat Saturday, after working five days at Spock, Saturday I would still be in the Spock zone. 
Sundays by about three or four o'clock in the afternoon it would start to go away. <laughs> I was very disciplined and um, I always saw too that I got enough sleep, head down to the pillow at 9.30 at night, out. And up the next morning at 5.30, I need eight hours sleep. I did then when I was working. I could get up at 5.30 in the morning and be at work at 6.30. If I caught a cup of coffee on the way out the door, and I could get to the studio by 6.30. And then I'd have some breakfast as I'm sitting in the chair. They'd bring me breakfast. And I, I could learn lines during that period of time. I could study my script. Sometimes the pages would come down late, and we'd be getting pages to a scene we didn't know the script to. So you had to play everything. So you didn't know what your character was or how I felt about you or what you felt about me. So you might as well play hate and love. I hate you and I love you. So maybe it's a little anxiety, but I don't care. Because you play everything. It took some time, psychologically, emotionally, creatively, to work out the proper balance. And Bill and I were very competitive with each other. Very competitive. I never thought of myself as anything other than a supporting actor, working equally as hard as Bill Shatner, not being paid as well, by the way, uh, <laughs> and wanting as much success as he did. I, I, was, I was competitive, I was uh, ambitious, but I never, I never misunderstood what role I was playing. And I keep trying to remember whether I felt envy, and all I can remember is feeling a moment momentary, you know, days or weeks of anxiety about the popularity of Spock. But I don't remember, uh, you know, being hysterical about it. My recollection of those days was camaraderie. And then, over the years, the friendship, the fondness, and the love between Leonard Nimoy and myself is... is I, I can't remember when it wasn't. We were extremely energetic and extremely aggressive about expressing our ideas, and sometimes there was a conflict. We'd have to work through it just like, uh, like any family members would. The character of Dr. Leonard Bones McCoy, played by D. Forrest Kelly, also really added to the Kirk and Spock dynamic, often getting frustrated with Spock and his Vulcan ways. The trio of Spock, Bones and Kirk and the camaraderie between each other was something special. De Forest uh, brought this southern charm uh, that he found very difficult to overcome by being a curmudgeon. Uh, so it was kind of like awkward, you know. He had to kind of force it. He was deceptively good in the role and uh, without showing a lot of effort. And, and the chemistry between he and I developed very quickly you know, on the insult banter level. He would call me a pointy-eared, green-blooded, whatever, and I would call him a witch doctor, and we'd be off. <laughs> That's great. So each script, it was not unlike, you know, when you go in and do a Western, you have a pretty good idea what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. But with Star Trek, uh, each script was a challenge. And uh, we could go into almost any different direction. For instance, we did a show called The Deadly Years which uh, enabled me to age to around 115, 125 years old, which was a real kick for an actor. I spent five hours each day in makeup alone for this. Now, you would never get that opportunity anyplace else to do that sort of thing, to be called upon to do that sort of thing. I found it a, 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 a challenging and interesting show to do. Another favorite character in the original series was the Enterprise's engineer, Montgomery Scott. Or should I say, Scotty? He was played by Canadian actor James Dewan. Why did they pick a Scotty? Is it because the No, no, I picked the Scottish. Did you? But I just oh. thought maybe because usually ship's engineers were always, in the old movies, were always Scots, weren't they? But you, I know, but you don't tell that to, uh, to an American. No. You know, you, uh, I, I, anyway, I did seven or eight different accents for them, and Gene Roddenberry said to me, he, uh, he says, which do you like? I said, well, I said, if he's going to be uh, 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 an engineer, he has to be Scots. Yeah. You know, well, poor old Scotty. He never got down to the face of the planet, did he? Oh, he was not always no. upstairs, beaming people up and down. And well, somebody had to look after the ship, you know. Of course. Under the lithium crystals. Aye, that's true. You have to stroke them every now and then, you know. Keep them warm. Jim was always breaking up when you stopped him, didn't you? We used to pull them together. Aye, that's true. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Lovely days for you, though. Was, oh, yes. There's a... Oh, the shows were great. I mean, the stories were fabulous. We loved 
doing those stories. Any actor loves a good story, you know. Yeah. It's just a marvelous kind of a thing when you, we, we would sit around a table and read the next five stories. You know, when somebody would say, oh boy, why did you read this one? Oh, that's, wow, that's why did you read this one and this one? You know, most marvelous. Unusual. Actor Leonard Nimoy would invent and add a number of original ideas which would become a great part of the character of Spock and the Vulcan culture, including the famous Vulcan salute for live long and prosper. That came from my Jewish background. It's, 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 uh, it's a gesture that the, uh, that's used in the priestly benediction during the uh, uh, Jewish services in synagogues. The, uh, the Kohanim, who are the priest tribe, Bless the congregation. When they do, they use this gesture, which is this is the shape of the letter Shin, Hebrew alphabet, you know, letter Shin. And the letter Shin is the first letter in the word Shaddai, which is the Almighty's name in Hebrew. And the suggestion is that they're using the symbol of the Almighty's name as they bless the congregation. I saw it done as a kid, was entranced by it, learned how to do it, and I brought it into Star Trek. Well, we're going to start shooting a show uh, within a couple of days, as a matter of fact, where we go back to Spock's uh, home planet, Vulcan, which we've Ooh. never done before, and, and we'll see what is supposed to be or what will represent a Vulcan wedding ceremony, mm. and that's going to be kind of interesting. You mean Spock was married before? Spock is going back to Vulcan to be married, mm. and I think uh, that'll turn out to be an interesting uh, uh, sequence. We were doing a lovely episode written by Theodore Sturgeon, wonderful script called uh, A Mock Time, in which uh, Spock has to be taken back to Vulcan. He insists on going back to Vulcan because he's going through this pon far condition, which is a mating condition, and he has to go back and, and fulfill a marriage betrothal that's been arranged since he was a child. We get back to the Vulcan planet, and, he, and we're confronted by the, this procession that comes out to meet us, and a very important matriarchal character being carried in a sedan chair, and and I'm to greet her and she's to welcome me back to Vulcan. I haven't been there in quite a while and we're supposed to say hello to each other. And I suggested to the director that there should be some Vulcan thing that Vulcans do when they greet, like humans shake hands or military people salute each other, Asian people bow to each other. We have rituals. What's the Vulcan ritual on a, on a greeting? And I said, well, how about that? I said, okay. So I did that and she did that. And, and next thing I knew it was in the script, spot with the Vulcan salute. You know? <laughs> It caught on. The Vulcan nerve pinch was another great added part of the Spock character, which Nimoy created and devised for the show. It was written that he hits him over the head with the butt of his phaser and knocks him out. And I said, I don't think that's appropriate. So I said to Bill, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to come up behind you and do this. And Bill did that and dropped it. I didn't want Spock involved in brawls. So I just found this way of dealing with it very simply and very quickly. Let's, let's talk about the special effects. When the Enterprise got hit by, say, a Klingon force beam, um, how did you work the trick? Did they shake the whole set, or did you guys have to shake yourselves? So what we do uh, now in the movies, as we did in the television set, is we tilt the camera. Now, I'm going to tell the cameraman to tilt his camera that way, and I'm going to show you how it works. Are you ready? Yeah, What's your ready. name? Rick? Okay, Rick, ready? You go that way. Ready? And go. <laughs> We did not have an awful lot of special effects in the original series. <clears throat> and special effects that were done were done very crudely and very quickly. The transporter thing was a, a very clever way of avoiding having to land the ship. To land the ship, to show the ship landing, would be an expensive special effect. You'd have to shoot the model coming in on the, on the planet, and then you'd have to have the exterior of the, of the entire ship or a large section of it, and the door would open, people come out, and so forth. Did away with all of that. You step into a little chamber, and and somebody would say, energize. You'd cut to the guy doing the buzz, buzz thing, and then you'd cut back to us standing there for, for a few seconds. Cut the film. Now we'd leave that chamber, and the camera would stay exactly in the same position, locked down, roll some film of the empty chamber, and do a simple dissolve from us there to us not there. So you see the figures gradually disappearing. The special effects department would take that film and put little gold glitter dripping through each character. So you'd have that, that ring, uh, ripple effect, and we were gone. It was minutes shooting it. It was a small, loyal audience. I think we attracted, averaged around 5 million viewers. Now, 5 million fans of viewers may seem like a lot, but in television terms back then, it wasn't. By the end of the second season, to keep Star Trek going for a third season, 
fans set up a massive letter writing campaign. There was something like 110,000 letters came in in a four or five week period. They were really inundated. There was some set, some successful chain letter networking was done. People put out word and said to 10 people, you put up, talk to 10 people. And the, the audience that we had was not large, but it was intense and vocal. I had a friend of mine, an executive at NBC, who went to his his car in the NBC secured parking lot and there were someone had written on his car don't cancel Star Trek. The campaign worked and Star Trek came back on television for a third season. NBC on air at the end of one of the episodes announced that Star Trek would be back the following season and the legend was they did that to stop the mail from coming. <laughs> so I guess it, it worked. By the third season there were budget cuts and a drop in the quality of the storylines, scripts and the special effects, which would lead to viewers switching off. The ratings would drop and it would lead to the cancellation of Star Trek. The first year, a year and a half, we'd had such excellent material and then I felt we were running downhill and I hated to see a good thing just deteriorate. And I felt very strongly that if we were going to go a fourth year, there should be some very serious changes. I never felt we were getting network support, never. They gave us a terrible time slot, and the show died a dismal death. And I frankly was relieved, because we're not doing good shows, we don't have an audience. Why run this thing into the ground? You know, we've done our best. Let's leave it, let it go, let it go. Ladies and gentlemen, due to the low Nielsen ratings, we at NBC have decided to unfortunately cancel Star Trek. Set phases is done. Fire! Nothing's happening, Jim. I can't understand it. Oh, and look, boys, you'll do me a favor and return these things to the property department, okay? When it went off the air, I believe it was in June of 1969, it had half of what its rating had been. I guess we weren't sufficiently entertaining. Star Trek just faded away and no one felt there was any future to it at all. What do you think is the, the legacy of the original Star Trek? Star Trek told us that we were all part of one civilization. And wouldn't it be wonderful if we could find a way to communicate with each other without being demanding and insisting that you be more like me? Uh, if we could find a way to enjoy each other's characteristics and, and understand and appreciate each other. And I think that's, that's the major legacy of the show.